Tragically, there have been instances where individuals working in various outdoor professions have fallen victim to fatal maulings by wild animals. Jobs such as wildlife researchers, biologists, and field technicians involve close proximity to nature and its inhabitants, introducing an inherent level of risk. These professionals often operate in environments where encounters with unpredictable wildlife can turn lethal. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three times people have been fatally mauled by deadly animals while at work. Welcome to Final Affliction. Twenty-four-year-old Patricia Wyman thought she had landed her dream job. She had applied to work at Halliburton Forest and Nature Reserve in Ontario, Canada. The position was for a caretaker of the North American Grey Wolves. When she was accepted and welcomed onto the team, she was delighted. She had always been fascinated with the species and working with them was going to be exhilarating. Halliburton Forest covers 100,000 acres and comprises millions of trees and more than 100 lakes. It offers members of the public ecotourism experiences in an incredible piece of Canada's wilderness. It is a sustainably managed forest which includes a research facility and education center. With the aim to educate people about wolves, they built a wolf center and introduced their first wolf pack in 1993. They have always tried to keep the wolves as wild as possible, allowing them to exhibit semi-natural behavior. There is no human interaction with the wolves, and visitors can only view them through the one-way glass. The only time they see human beings is at feeding time. Patricia had recently completed her undergraduate degree in wildlife biology in the University of Guelph in Ontario. When she arrived for her induction, her supervisor warned her of the dangers of working with wolves. They had been in captivity for their entire lives, but they were not socialized with humans. That's the way the reserve wanted it to be. The wolves were free to roam their 15-acre enclosure. When the caretaker took them their food, the wolves would hide away. They were timid and shy, just like wolves are in the wild. They kept their distance from humans and had never given the staff any reason to be overly concerned. Patricia was introduced to her work routine, which included educating the public, giving talks, and caring for the wolf pack. She was taken into the wolf enclosure and shown where to feed them. The following day, she was tasked with feeding them alone. As Patricia unlocked the gate and stepped inside, she felt an uneasy feeling wash over her. She looked around, but couldn't see any of the wolves. She walked purposefully to spot where she dumped the food. She set it down, but when she turned to leave, she noticed the alpha male watching her. The way he was standing sent alarm bells ringing. The hairs on the back of Patricia's neck stood on end. He wasn't timid like the rest of them. He was eyeing up this new member of staff. He was sizing her up. His manner was odd and something about him unsettled Patricia. When she returned home that evening, she recalled her day's events to her fiancé. She was excited about her new role, but also mentioned her apprehension when it came to the alpha male in the pack. Although Patricia had clearly been unsettled by this particular wolf, she didn't share her concerns with her supervisor. Being new, perhaps she didn't want to cause a fuss. Maybe she was wrong about him anyway. The staff at the center had never raised any concern about him before, but Patricia's instincts were right. There was something about the wolf's behavior that was worrying. Something had triggered a behavior change in him, and with her expert knowledge and understanding of wolf behavior, Patricia had noticed it. The following day, on April 18, 1996, Patricia entered the enclosure once more. This time, she wasn't there to feed the wolves. The wolves were only fed once every five days. In fact, no one knows why Patricia went into the enclosure on her own that day. And no one knows exactly what happened next, but Chief Investigator Eric Klinghammer came to the following conclusion. 
Patricia unlocked the gate to the wolf paddock. The metal framework clanged behind her, alerting the wolves to her presence. For some reason, she wanted to see them in their enclosure, but they weren't close enough to the fence. The paddock was littered with fallen trees. They lay scattered across the grass. Patricia stepped over them as she searched for the wolf pack. She had only walked through the enclosure a little distance before she came across them, five large adults lying down in the grass. They were already looking in Patricia's direction. They had already heard her. They had already smelt her. When they saw Patricia approach, they stood up and pricked their ears. Patricia stood still. She didn't know whether to stand and face them or retreat slowly. She had been told that they normally flee when they see a person in their territory. They were normally hesitant, but not today. As Patricia stood there, frozen to the spot, the wolves walked forwards. They started to surround her, circling her. Patricia was trapped. She must have felt fear. She must have panicked when she saw them advancing. Her adrenaline would have surged as the telltale signs of an imminent attack grew. Her heart thundered in her chest. The wolves stepped forward once more. Their eyes locked onto the young woman. The alpha male approached. Patricia stepped backwards. As she did so, she tripped over a fallen tree and fell to the ground. That was all it took. One single trip and the wolves seized the opportunity to attack. In a second, Patricia felt the weight of one of the wolves on top of her as she scrabbled about on the ground. She knew she was in big trouble. She knew this was it. She tried desperately to get up, but the wolf was joined by more. In a frenzied attack, the pack bit her all over, clamping their jaws around her legs and arms. Pulling her limbs in all directions, she felt the tearing of skin and muscle. She put up a brave fight, trying to lash out and fight them off. But there were too many of them, each weighing up to 175 pounds or 80 kilograms, they were strong and powerful. Their sharp teeth and jaws designed to subdue and kill their prey can crush bone. Patricia felt herself grow weaker. As she lay there, she tried to cover her neck and head. She had no more fight left in her. She was bleeding heavily. Patricia died that day. It was only her fourth day in her dream job. Her years of study had built up to a job like this and it ended so brutally and tragically. To their shock and horror, two employees of the reserve found Patricia's body that afternoon. They immediately phoned the Ontario Provincial Police who rushed over. Two officers drew their weapons and entered the enclosure. As they made their way over to Patricia's body, they saw the wolves standing guard. But they hadn't eaten her. A few bites had been taken from her extremities, but her torso was largely untouched. The savage attack had ripped the clothes from her, and multiple bite marks suggested at least five wolves had piled in on the attack. Maybe more. As the officers stepped closer, one wolf lowered its head, fixed its eyes on them, and let out a deep, menacing growl. This behavior was a sign that it was protecting its kill. The officers then noticed another wolf step forward, and then another. Gradually, the two policemen were being circled by wolves. They were surrounded, just as the wolves had done with Patricia. Outnumbered and not sure of the wolves' intentions, the officers fired a couple of warning shots in the air. The loud bangs shocked the wolves and sent them running. The two officers fled the enclosure and called for backup. When more officers arrived at the center, six entered the paddock to retrieve Patricia's body. They did so without further incident. The investigator, Eric Klinghammer, suggested that the reason the wolves had not eaten Patricia was because they tend to avoid unfamiliar food. 
His conclusions of what happened on that fateful day came from over 25 years of experience studying and working with wolves. He also had extensive knowledge of wolf behavior and attacks on humans by both wild and captive canines. It was tragic that such a young and enthusiastic woman lost her life doing what she loved. We will never know why she entered the wolf enclosure that day. Maybe she innocently wanted to observe their behavior close up, but where there are predators, there are always dangers, and this time it led to her unfortunate final affliction. When it comes to animals in the wild, it's well known that mothers will protect their young, no matter what. Whether it's a tiny frog to a huge lion, the females of these species will do everything they can to ensure that their young live and grow up to become proper adult animals. And as the old adage goes, one of the scariest animals that you don't want to mess with is a mama bear and her cubs. David Montoya was an 18-year-old from Hollis in Oklahoma. As a young man, he had always been unsure as to what he wanted to do when he grew up. Whilst most of his friends in his school had an idea of what they wanted to do, David was slightly less sure about how he wanted to live his life. Despite this, he was a good student in school, getting good grades. However, he sometimes found it difficult to focus on his lessons. Instead, he wished that he was outside doing something practical. When it came time for his graduation, the young man had decided that he wanted to work with his hands, as he found it a lot more interesting than sitting in an office. Seeing that there was a job going for contractors at an Idaho-based company called Timberline Drilling, David decided to go and mine silver in Alaska, as he thought that it would be the perfect opportunity to get out of Oklahoma and go traveling, whilst also getting to earn a bit of money. The salaries of silver miners in the U.S. range from $30,880 to $70,360, but David was just excited to be finally out of school and making money. Being new to the job and probably one of the youngest on the job site, David knew that he would likely be earning the lower end of the average salary. However, for a young man just out of school, $30,000 a year was a good start. After securing the job, David packed his bags and flew out of Oklahoma, excited to start his job in Alaska. Once in Alaska, the young man was taken out to the drill site, which was so remote in its location that it was only accessible via helicopter. The drill site itself was located on the edge of the Hecla Greens Creek Mine property on an island in southeastern Alaska. For David, the whole experience was completely new and exhilarating. The wild landscape was something that he had never truly experienced before, especially not on the scale that Alaska boasts. The state has approximately 222 million acres of federal land, which is roughly about 60% of the state. Of that vast acreage, there are about 57.5 million acres of designated wilderness, along with some 16.5 million acres of proposed wilderness areas. Alaska's designated wilderness acreage makes up approximately 54% of the entire nation's wilderness. Considering just how much more wild the state was compared to Oklahoma, it was safe to say that David was feeling a little overwhelmed. However, the young man was determined to do well at his job. It was a very difficult and very physically demanding job, which left David feeling exhausted more often than not. But the young man enjoyed his work and he felt that he was learning valuable life skills as he did it. Because Alaska is so wild, there are plenty of animals to be seen in the great outdoors, and one of these animals are bears. With more than 40,000 grizzly bears and 100,000 black bears roaming wild, it's not difficult at all to spot one of these amazing animals out and about. In fact, Admiralty Island is famous for its coastal grizzlies and has the densest population of bears per square mile in North America. An estimated 1,500 brown bears roam about on the island, according to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, meaning that it is common to spot one without too much trouble tracking them down. Roughly five months after beginning his job as a silver miner, David had gotten into quite a good routine. He would wake up early, have his breakfast, and then head off to the drill site where he would happily work, mining as much silver as he could. 
However, on this particular day, things didn't quite go according to plan. After working his morning shift, David was happy to finally go on break. Whilst he loved his job, it was still very exhausting, and taking a moment to relax and unwind in the fresh air was something that he always looked forward to. It was whilst the 18-year-old was wandering around the site, stretching his legs, that he stumbled across something he wished he hadn't. There, standing only a few feet in front of him, was a huge brown bear and her two cubs. Instantly, David froze in fear. When he had first began his job, he was made to go to a company meeting which discussed the mine's bear safety program. This included training that all workers, contractors, and visitors must complete before going to the site. Workers are taught ways to prevent bear encounters, including proper disposal of food. And, in remote locations, bear spray is among the tools employees generally bring with them in the case of bear encounters. Unfortunately for David, he had forgotten his bear spray. He also forgot the most important rule when dealing with a bear, not to make any sudden movements or noises. After noticing the bear, David quickly tried to backtrack. However, his panicked, fast movement scared the mama bear and her cubs, who thought that David was probably trying to threaten them. Not wanting her babies to get hurt, the mama grizzly rose up onto her back legs to try and make herself look more imposing before letting out a loud roar. Scared, David turned and tried to run. However, this set off the bear's hunting instinct. The huge bear charged after David, easily catching up to him as she could run as fast as 35 miles per hour. Once she had caught up to the young man, the mama grizzly began ferociously attacking him. She bit down where her teeth would reach and clawed relentlessly at his body. David was in utter agony, trying desperately to get away from the onslaught, but with a massive 600-pound bear on him, pinning him down, there was no way for him to escape. To make matters worse, the bear's cubs also ran over and began mauling David. They were learning from their mother, not understanding that attacking humans wasn't something that they should be doing. Sadly, despite David's efforts to get away, he was unable to escape the three bears. It wasn't long before one of the young man's co-workers went looking for David as he was due back to work from his break. But when they found him, they couldn't believe their eyes. The mother bear and her two cubs were gathered around David's lifeless body, feasting on it, completely ignoring the men approaching them while they consumed David. Because they were in quite a wild place, a lot of the security at the mine site had guns. It was with these guns that the mama bear and her babies were euthanized. State troopers were then called to the island so that they could help sort out the situation. In the end, David's body was taken to the state medical examiner's office for an autopsy, where it was determined that the death was caused by the bears themselves. At first, David's co-workers were unsure if he had died from some kind of accident and the bears had found him already dead. The medical examiners were able to confirm he died of blood loss resulting from a bite to the neck. His body was then sent back to his home in Oklahoma so that his friends and family could give him a proper funeral. Everyone was devastated at the loss of David as he was a well-liked young man who made friends with everyone he met. To make matters worse, he was only a week away from his 19th birthday when the attack took place. His family were left in shock and they constantly miss him. However, whilst it is sad what happened to David, it is also sad how the attack was handled, with the mama bear and her two cubs being shot in retaliation for the attack. It is likely that the mama was simply trying to protect her babies from what she perceived to be danger. Others point to the three bears eating David's body to suggest the bears had mauled him as part of a predatory attack, possibly the mother bear teaching her cubs how to hunt, with the humans being the prey. If this was the case, if the bears hadn't been shot after the attack, it's likely they would have continued hunting humans, bringing more innocent people like David Montoya to their terrifying final affliction. When we think of farming, we typically think of fields of wheat or a herd of cows. But in some parts of the world, crocodiles are farmed. They are produced not only for their meat, but for their skins and eggs as well. It is a big business in places like Cambodia, where it provides a living for many families. 
but unlike farming cows and sheep, this farming is a deadly game. When your livestock consider you as their prey, you know you need to be tough to survive. One wrong move, and it could be game over. Luan Nam was a veteran in the business of crocodile farming. He was 72 years old and farmed more than 40 crocodiles on his land. His farm was one of more than 900 across Cambodia, just outside Siam Reap, Cambodia's second largest city. 60% of the kingdom's crocodile farms are situated in this region. The climate is ideal for crocodile production, but not much can be said of the conditions in which they are kept. In Cambodia, Siamese crocodiles and saltwater crocodiles are the most common species to be farmed. Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan are the biggest importers of crocodile products in the world. They consume the meat and use different body parts in traditional medicine and pharmaceuticals. More than a million skins are exported by crocodile farmers every year, and these are highly prized in the fashion industry. A crocodile farmer can expect a crocodile's value to be double what was paid to grow and harvest it, but prices vary across the world. And the industry in Cambodia has seen a steady decline in the value of its commercial crocodiles. In a bid to keep production costs down and cleaning to a minimum, in Cambodia, crocodiles are confined to concrete enclosures and fed dead fish, corn flour soaked in blood, and chunks of meat. It is a miserable existence for these prehistoric reptiles. Luan's family knew just how dangerous the business was. Luan had many close calls before. Keeping the highly intelligent animals in unnatural environments could drive them mad with aggression. His farm was a concrete pit. In the center, there was a rectangular freshwater pool in which the crocodiles could swim and cool off. It was green and murky. The surrounds were all made of cold, hard concrete. There was no environmental enrichment for the giant reptiles. It was a bleak environment. Steel steps led down to the ground from walkways above. Wooden planks balanced across raised concrete pillars helped Luan move around without entering the enclosure. But it was a dangerous and precarious setup. One slip and he would plummet into the concrete pit and the eagerly waiting crocodiles below. Fish that cost 50 cents per kilo were tossed from these walkways. Younger crocodiles were fed daily, but the adults usually only once a week. Although they were fed in this way, their killer instincts were still there. Fights often broke out, the overcrowded enclosure erupting into a pit of loud hisses, thrashing water, and fearsome biting matches. Luan had erected metal cages in which the female crocodiles could lay their eggs. These were a precious commodity. He sold them to other farms or on the Chinese market. But accessing the eggs could often prove challenging. The females were protective of their clutch. They would hiss at Luan if he came too close. His only form of defense was a stick that he held out in front of him. It was the only barrier between him and his deadly livestock. A crocodile's jaws can exert a force of more than 3,500 PSI. They would snap the stick in half like a matchstick, but better the stick than his leg. In May 2023, Luan arrived at his farm as usual. His family had begged him for years to give up the business. They knew how dangerous it was for him, and at 72 years old, he certainly wasn't getting any younger. The prices for crocodiles and their products were steadily declining as direct markets were fluctuating and there was less demand from neighboring countries. But changing careers at that age would be difficult for Luan. He knew his business inside out, and it just about provided for his family. He took pride in being the president of the local Crocodile Farmers Association. There was no way he was giving up now. Adult females used to reach between $500 and $600 but in recent years had dropped to $150. The profitability of crocodile farming in Cambodia was dropping, but it was all Luan had ever known. A female crocodile was inside one of the metal nesting cages that morning. She was protecting her clutch when Luan arrived on the scene. The crocodiles typically laid between 20 and 60 eggs between February and May, and the hatchlings would emerge between April and July. In 2019, these babies would fetch a price of $7 to $10 per head, but by 2020, this price had dropped to just $2.50.
Cambodia's crocodile farmers were barely breaking even. Each and every crocodile produced on the farm was valuable, and Luan needed to make sure that all the eggs made it to hatching. Luan climbed down the metal steps and into the enclosure, keeping his eyes on the inhabitants closely. The egg-laying cage was on a raised platform, set back from the rest of the crocodiles. As he approached the female, she hissed loudly, her mouth open, displaying all 70 of her lethal, sharp teeth. Luan hit the cage with his stick. The crocodile thrashed her tail from side to side. She was angry. Luan prodded her, and she began to move out of the cage. As she neared the edge of it, she suddenly lunged at Luan's stick. She grabbed it in her jaws and clamped down. Instinctively, Luan pulled the stick backwards, but in doing so, he lost his footing and fell. He landed on the ground of the crocodile enclosure with a heavy thud. The enormous reptiles wheeled around. All 40 of them had their eyes locked onto the small farmer. They spotted him lying helplessly on the ground, and before he had a chance to get to his feet, they ran over to him. Luan knew that he was in serious trouble. He had never been in that situation before, and he knew what was coming. In an instant, some crawled out of the water, dragging themselves onto dry land. Others, basking on the side of the pool, leapt to their feet. As they ran towards him, their tails swayed from side to side, and their short legs moved quickly underneath their enormous, heavy bodies. Their mouths were closed in their characteristic toothy grin, but as they came within striking distance, they opened, gaping wide. To them, this was fresh meat at feeding time. Before he could react, one quickly lunged forward and grabbed Luan's leg. It shook its head, shaking the man violently from side to side. He cried out and tried to reach down and release himself from the vice-like grip. But as he did so, another launched an attack, this time biting down on his arm. It violently ripped his arm from his body and swallowed it, whole, in front of him. Blood poured onto the concrete. Luan was desperate. Nobody was around to hear his cries. Nobody knew the danger he was in. Luan continued to fight back. He was losing blood. He could feel the raw power from the crocodiles as they lunged at him and bit down. Another crocodile joined the feeding frenzy and pulled Luan so hard that he felt his hip give way. He was dragged across the concrete, scraping his back as he was pulled towards the stagnant green water. Then, with an almighty splash, he was dragged in. The forty crocodiles slid into the pool after him, each lunging at the body, pulling and tugging. One performed a death roll. Luan, now barely conscious, held his breath as he was washing machined over and over under the water. He could feel the pressure building in his leg. He could feel the intense searing pain as more and more crocodiles attacked him, taking bites out of him. But he couldn't fight any longer. He couldn't hold them off. It was a losing battle. In less than a few minutes, Luan had lost his fight. His body lay limp in the water. Swirls beneath the surface and splashes around his limbs continued. The green water turned red as the crocodiles feasted, tugging at the corpse. Another crocodile pulled the man's body out onto dry land, and that is where Luan was found when workers arrived at the farm. He was surrounded by a pool of his own blood, his arm was missing, and bite marks covered his body from head to toe. Emergency services were called, but there was nothing they could do for the farmer. He had succumbed to his injuries within minutes of the feeding frenzy. His lifeless body was surrounded by the hungry reptiles, and every time officials tried to get close to him to retrieve his body, the crocodiles hissed and snapped. One crocodile lay just meters away, a prized possession in its jaw. It was Luan's black sandal held tightly between its teeth, a trophy of sorts and a chilling reminder of the terror that must have unfolded earlier that day. When you see the basic setup of some of the world's crocodile farms, it is surprising that there aren't more incidents like this. However, just four years earlier, a two-year-old girl wandered into her family's crocodile farm and was eaten alive in the very same village as Luan Nam's farm. Most of the rural farms have a distinct lack of safety measures in place and very few barriers to stop this kind of thing from happening. It took time and courage before Luan could be pulled from the enclosure by officials. Securing his body meant that now his family were now able to bury him and mourn their loss. 
They had begged him to sell the farm years ago, and now his business had cost him his life. After his death, Luan's family sold the farm and all the crocodiles in it, something Luan should have done years before, but tragically never did. The very thing that provided him a living all these years had ended up being the cause of his terrifying final affliction.